So we're excited today for this discussion that I think is going to cover a range of topics that mean a lot to us as a congregation interested in racial justice and environmentalism and food justice. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Carter. That's like virtual hand clap, virtual hand clap. <laughs> Well, okay, one thing I want to say really uh, briefly, or I guess, uh, is that it's uh, technically, actually, I have a role at UC San Diego, but my, my ac academic professor teaching role is at the University of San Diego. Oh, That's a Catholic thanks. school. My role with UC San Diego actually is anti-racism training. And so I'm currently working, um, a colleague and I are working with them right now with the School of Public Health um, to facilitate 10 workshops of 30 people basically help them create an implement an annual kind of anti-racism training um institution for their school of public health which has actually been really cool so i'm it's interesting like i am connected to to both institutions but i don't quite have a, a i don't think they gave me a profile at uc san diego yet they may have i don't know um but nonetheless it doesn't matter people get that stuff mixed up all the time so My uh, no it's, it's totally fine it's totally fine but just in case anybody was going to look this up, I want to make sure they know where to go. Um, again, and you should. <laughs> thank you uh, uh, for having me and for inviting me. Um, when, I was, when I told my wife uh, that I, I was speaking here, she was like, oh, we've never, I've been inside the church, uh, I think maybe twice. Because I think when um, I was at Claremont, we had a baccalaureate. We had two events there for whatever reason. I can't quite remember exactly what they were. But um, so just so you all know, I'm an alumnus of Claremont School of Theology. So I graduated uh, with my Master of Divinity from there in 2010. I, I got a second MA, or I was in my PhD. I got an MA and my PhD in 2012 and I finished my PhD in 2014. Um, and so I have a lot of degrees uh, from that institution. So I was there for a while. Uh, my wife and I really enjoyed our time in Claremont. Um, we originally came from Michigan and uh, when I flew out to California to visit Claremont, um, I called my wife. It was like Feb into February, and my flight was delayed because we're flying out of Chicago. There's like all kinds of snow, and I landed uh, at LAX, and I called my wife, um, and I was like, "Man, I just have a really good feeling about this this school. I have a good feeling about this place." And um, she was like, "Oh, you know, have you gone to the campus? Is the campus really nice or anything?" And I was like, "No, I'm in the airport. It's 75 degrees outside." <laughs> I have a really good feeling about this place <laughs> compared to where we just left. <laughs> so we relate to that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, there's something about um, that space uh, to be in Southern California, but also to be honest, the energy of Claremont is something I really appreciated. I love the collegial atmosphere um, and the community there. I thought I really appreciated. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start out by actually, t well, we'll get to it telling you a little bit more about myself, but I'm gonna, uh, share my screen and get to the presentation I put together. Um, and what is that? There are a couple times, actually, early on. I think probably twice, or once early on and once later on, where I have specific time set up just to kind of ask you all uh, some questions. Um, you can feel free to unmute yourself as you are able to and answer, or you can type in the chat if that's more comfortable for you. Um, just what, and if you don't feel like you necessarily have anything to say, that's fine too. You shouldn't feel pressured to share. Um, this is uh, an open forum, and, and really the questions aren't deeply theological, they're just more reflective. And so, as you can see, the title of uh, this talk is Spirituality Served Food Justice as Spiritual Practice. And, and for me, when I think about um, food systems, not even just the food I eat, but food systems, I think about them with respect to uh, how they, how I'm interconnected with the rest of the world and, and how might I make uh, my, those connections, how might I eat and, and consume um, things that are in ways consistent with my understanding of my faith, right, and what I feel the gospel is calling us to do. Um, and so for me, a lot of my uh, interest in this emerges from my own story. I didn't go to graduate school thinking I was going to do anything. I didn't even think I was going to get a PhD, let alone um, focus on environmental justice and racial justice. Um, it all kind of happened as a process of reflection. And so I found that reflection is really important in this work. Um, and so uh, one question I think is important um, is for us to really kind of wrestle with as we even begin this conversation is, is why food justice? Like, why should it matter? 
because quite honestly, many progressive organizations ha have a general awareness that our food choices, again, are having a significant impact on ecological well-being. Um, like this isn't new news, I would say in the last 20 or so years, um, yet they're still choosing to do business as normal, right? Or make nominal low impact changes. And so the question I have just posed briefly, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a second so we can all kind of look at each other, is why do you think this might be the case, right? What might be some of the obstacles that prevent us uh, or prevent people from making changes to perhaps the food we eat or how we get our food, even though we know that the current process is actually causing us harm and causing our, our planet harm? Do you guys have, anybody have any, any, any thoughts or ideas or speculations? I think food is, um, we learn that from our families and from our childhood, and we uh, feel that deeply as part of our history. Oh, it is very much a part of who we are. Like our food tells a story that's deeply embedded in our identity. There's certain things that you can eat and if I, if, I, if I be so bold to say that probably bring you back to when you were a child. You're mm -hmm. like, I remember eating this thing and I have a vivid memory of eating it and doing this thing. And so food is deeply personal, right? And so to, 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 to upset, to make those kinds of changes requires us to, to think and reflect, okay, what does this say about me and who I am if I choose to eat this thing in a different kind of way? That's, ex that's a, a great, great answer. Uh, there's some answers popping up in the chat as well. Traditions, that's, that's similar to what Anna said, like how we were raised is, is personal. Convenience, I think is really important, especially for working class folk, I would say. People who just have to try to get something either to feed their children or something to get by. Um, economic limitations, because the way our food system is structured is, is definitely makes it difficult for many people. Um, I really appreciate, uh, I'm going to say, Sandra's, we just eat without any forethought to where our food comes from and how our choices affect anyone else. I'm like, that, I think, is, in some ways, I think, endemic of what it means to probably grow up in a place like, or be in a place like California, where maybe most of the agricultural area is, is, is really limited to Central California. Where I'm from in Michigan, you were aware where the food came from because you could see it because where I was from, there was actually space in between towns, right? Like you leave one town, there would be land and a farm and things like that. And then another town, it wasn't just like towns interconnected. And so um, you were deeply aware. And, and, and to be fair to my own home community, uh, with regards to in Michigan, what you see happening is a lot of progressive food politics that is beyond what we might call party lines because it's still a kind of an agricultural community. Um, and so I, I, these are excellent answers, lack of knowledge, um, and especially, I see Peggy put something on here about uh, compensation. Compensation, I think, is really uh, important with regards to the kinds of, of uh, ways that we think about how farmers are compensated, but also farm workers. Addiction to sweets, now that is, there is a, so I wish I could say more about that. I, I actually cut that out, but I will say, the role that sugar plays is huge, is huge. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but there's an excellent book by this guy named Sidney Mintz called Sweetness and Power that basically talks about the role sugar plays in colonialism, like it's fascinating. So addiction to sweets is I think a really, really important uh, thing that, that many people don't actually get a chance to realize how powerful it is to dictating what our diet is. So you guys are doing great. Fantastic, amazing answers. I think you're actually gonna really enjoy the rest of what I have to say, uh, in part because of what you guys are saying. So let me get back to sharing the screen uh, and to the presentation here real quick. So why, why is it? You guys named so many excellent reasons as to why it is challenging for some people um, and, and, and why there are obstacles that are put in place, whether it be our identities or economic limitations, a uh, particular kind of lack of awareness, um, the role that we may be addicted or just con to, to, to sugar or convenience. All these things are at play. And I would say that it's not any necessarily one of them um, uh, like that's particularly pervasive. I think one that is the most 
that connects with everybody is the ways in which food is steeped in our identity. I think the way food is steeped in our identity, our cultural identities, our family identities, and things of that nature. And so what I have tried to do is, is, is to wrestle with that and to think critically about what food means to me and, and what food means to us and what food should mean and food justice could mean in institutions. Now, to be clear, I do think some people will be persuaded just by data, right? When you say, hey, this is data, this is how it's impacted, so we should make this change. Some people will, but not most. Most people need to be convinced of the urgency of the issue. It requires us to feel the negative impact of animal agriculture from those who are victimized. And, I, and I should, it should, it's broader than just animal agriculture. That's something I'm talking about today. But we need to feel the impact of our agricultural systems and how it harms people, how it harms uh, non-human animals, and how it harms creation to imagine another way, right? To really in, 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 in like enliven ourselves, to think creatively. It's like there has to be another way to do this, right? To eat for us to grow and procure our food. So why does this matter to me? What came up for me and, and, and what happened? So um, I, again, as I mentioned, um, come from Michigan. My family, like most uh, Black families uh, in America, you know, originated in the South, although mine is a lot more complex, <laughs> as y'all get to in a moment. Um, so that's my grandfather, Robert Martin. Um, he was born in 19, Mississippi in 1935. Um, he worked in cotton fields and different kinds of uh, fields of picking, um, harvesting um, from the time he was eight years old. Um, he drops out of school after he's 12 um, to work year round um, to help secure economic security for his family. What's fascinating when I talked to my grandfather about um, his time growing up, really up into his early 20s is when he talks about how he had to live and what he had to endure, what he went through, it doesn't sound all that different when he's talking about 1950s, right? It doesn't sound all that different from what I read about in the 1850s, like actually, literally actual enslavement. Um, and it, it seems to me that every time he would share these stories, I would just think, wow, this is the conditions where you guys had to live, the outhouses you're living in, they're not having any kind of access to not only civil rights, but any kind of legal recourse to salary they were getting paid. Um, it, it, it was terrible. And so I would ask him when he would share these stories, I was like, you know, how did, like, you know, when you think about this, like, how, you know, how do you feel about it now? Or, and all these other kinds of kind of reflective moments. Um, and, he says one time, we were sharing, and this is actually a story of my book, he's like, well, you know, things could have been worse because at least I generally speaking, I always had something to eat. Um, and he has this particular air of gratefulness, this air of gratefulness that he was able to survive. And he recognizes that many of his peers didn't for lots of reasons. He ultimately fled Michigan or fled Mississippi to Michigan because a threat on his life, uh, because uh, he wanted to quit working for a white employer who basically said, you either work for me or I'll kill you. So he uh, fled in the middle of the night to Michigan and Southern Three Rivers, Michigan. Called for my grandmother to meet him up there. And that's where they decided to settle. Um, but in spite of all this, there is, you have this man who's very optimistic and always forward looking. Um, and I think more than anything I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot of things from my grandfather. And I probably will say about three or four more things I've learned from, from him in this uh, talk today. Um, is what it means to really be grateful for what we have and to recognize how challenging it has been for those who came before us. Um, and for me, that's just something that has always been inspiring. Now, that's my uh, maternal uh, grandfather. My paternal side of the family is actually uh, Spanish. Um, so my great-grandfather, uh, Joe Carter, um, he was the first Carter to be born in America. His parents immigrated from uh, the Basque region in Spain. Um, and I say Carter in parentheses because their last name was Carter Dodd and it subsequently changed um, pre-World War I um, because of the politics of the era. Uh, they thought it was safer to change their name. So he was a plantation overseer, meaning while he did not live in an over, well, he did live, but he didn't have a job as an overseer in an overlapping era as my maternal grandfather, 
he was a plantation overseer is a person who drives the labor, who is the white person who rides around making sure that the black labor is actually doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and so it's on the opposite side of the economic system. Um, so he marries one of uh, his field workers' uh, daughters who is black and um, she's light skinned black. And so you have this mixing in my family um, where you have one side, my mom's side, or my dad's side of family where everybody is fairly light. Um, and then you have my mom's side of family, everybody's fairly dark. Um, and, and this history for me is intertwined in my, my focus on this work because I recognize that I have benefited from both the, or I benefited from the privileges of the Carter side of the family, benefited from the privileges of the ability to exploit labor. And I've also um, though, and, and continue to do with the consequences of what it means to have generational poverty um, on the Martin side of my family. And so all of these things influence how I think and talk and, 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 and honestly how I live and breathe when I talk about food justice because I try to look at things from a holistic perspective and not try to scapegoat anybody but suggest and, and try to challenge us to think how might we be more accountable to what it is we're doing. Fundamentally for me, this comes out of my orientation as a Christian. Recognizing that when you read the biblical text, you see that the religion of Christianity emerges from within agricultural community of ancient Israelite religion that was a religion of farmers, right? So I say ancient Israelite religion because this is kind of like pre what we might call formal um, Judaism, right? It was, just, it, it was the best way to describe it is ancient Israelite religion. But when you read the text, when you start reading just with Genesis chapters one and two, you see these are people who you are using farming and land analogies all the time. Like if you actually are someone who grew up on a farm, it is so obvious, or even grew up in a rural area, it's so obvious when you read the Bible that this is a, is a text that's agrarian, that's deeply agrarian. And so that influence was still uh, pertinent and still present in the time of Christ. Um, and so we think about the fact that as Christians, we, we look to the gospels to really to glean our kind of ethics, I should say, even if we don't use it necessarily to understand everything, but our, our particular ethics, where we say how we should be in the world, I believe, and I argue that we should look to this person that we call Jesus, this, this our Jesus, the Christ, to determine how might we live in ways consistent with who we are called to be. And when we do that, we recognize that Jesus, while growing up in agricultural community, also was Jewish in a very particular context, what we call Roman colonial occupation, right? Jesus grew up in an area where he was poor, had no political power, he was not a Roman citizen, and, and thus was not afforded the benefits of citizenship, right? So he found himself in a place that very much uh, emulates what we might call many of the migrant workers that we have in our own communities today. 90% of the population of Palestine were peasants. 90% of the people didn't own land and basically were dependent upon selling their labor to other people, right, in ways in which they could be fully exploited. They dealt with high taxes, um, and there was a time of rampant, um, both religious and political construct, con corruption. And so in this space, Jesus emerges as a social prophet who, who is leaning into the tradition of Jeremiah and Isaiah and other prophets of his own uh, tradition. And he's saying that the only way we can actually begin to reclaim who we are, right, and, and, and reclaim and, and reemerge in his relationship with God is to do what he says in the greatest commandment, right? These kind of three uh, part spiritual path of a deepening connection to our, the compassion of God, of loving God, right? A restoration to a humanity full of love, fully loved and alive, loving ourselves. And an increase to our capacity to be instruments of compassion toward others in the world, to loving our neighbors. For Jesus, these three things embodies this way of being in the world that ultimately drive his entire ministry. They drive everything that he does. They are his, his guidelines, if you will. And, and while it may seem easy when you say it on first glance, when you look at what this looked like for Jesus's life and the life of his disciples and what I would suggest should be the life of the church, we recognize the, the difficulty of this challenge, right? That Indeed, to be connected to God is to see the suffering of the world as God sees the suffering of the world and to do something about it. And we see this in Jesus' ministry, right? And what Dolores Williams called his ministerial vision. To love ourselves 
requires to recognize that the spirit of the God is in us, lives in us, and should animate how we interact with the world. What he says in Luke 4, when he comes back to Nazareth and he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and he's like, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has called me to do this work in the world. And again, what it means to be a spirit of compassion towards others, Matthew 25 essentially says, right? This is this, this where, where God, where it's the end times, right? Where there's this moment of judgment where uh, someone who's a stranger, right? To God is welcome because despite the fact that they are a stranger, they treated God like they would want to be treated, right? You have the person crawling out saying, you know, um, Lord, Lord, when did I, you know, give you food? When did I give you clothing? When did I give you shelter? Why do I do these things? And then God replies, like, whatever you did to the least of these, you have done to me. And so there's this, this powerful three-point path that I think influences and animates not only the spirit and, and, and what should be how we understand what it means to practice Christianity, but more specifically, right, how it means and how it should influence how we think about practicing uh, food justice. And so some of this, I think part of the, the challenge we have, I believe, is that when especially when it comes to that last point, um, we are in a space, as someone mentioned, um, how we are disconnected from where our food is, is grown and how it's produced, where we um, other uh, food and farm workers, we are deeply unaware of the ways in which our agricultural system exploits them. And with the exception of corporate <laughs> farmers who really, really suffer. Now, um, again, as I said in the slide, the majority of the world's religions have proscriptive obligations to care for our neighbors. But this care is, notion, is rooted in the notion of common humanity. The challenge we face is that what we mean when we say human is often implicitly understood to be white or to perform whiteness. So think about a time you've heard someone say, well, these people are acting like animals. These people are behaving like animals. Or wow, you know, that same kind of animalistic language is the kind of language you often heard this summer with the social uprisings, but often language you hear when someone is not saying these people actually aren't a part of the species Homo sapien. Rather, they are saying they're not behaving as we believe humans ought to behave, which generally means they are not living according to the ways in which we civilized folk we group of people in power believe they ought be because they are resisting perhaps this particular structure that has been placed upon them that they know um, marginalizes them. And so the challenge that we all face is to humanize those people, to humanize those whom Jesus refers to as enemies, but who I often refer to as difficult others, right? Because if we do not humanize them, then we tacitly accept the logic of dehumanization, right? So we must discern, as I put in here, what is preventing them from doing what we know to be more, they are to be morally obligated to do. So this is, for me, the classic example of Jesus' commandment to turn the other cheek. And when you actually break that down, what you see is that Jesus is not saying that we are to submit to violence. Rather, turning the other cheek in this particular time, in this particular context, was asserting yourself, was standing up to the Roman authority and saying, no, if you hit me, you have to hit me with your other hand. You have to hit me with your right hand, which is meaning you're going to have to recognize my common humanity. You have to see me as a full human being. But to do that, for the Roman soldier to do that was to go against their own particular kind of code of recognizing the full humanity of those who they had colonized, right? And so this is nonviolent resistance. This is not passive. This is, in fact, resistance rooted deep in the wisdom of our own particular religious tradition. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the impacts, and then I want to end by saying, what it is that we can do and kind of open it up and have a, a lot broader conversation. So what are some of the impacts of our food, uh, food systems as it is right now? Um, the environmental impact is pretty devastating. <laughs> Land resources are pretty much um, sucked up uh, for the production of meat and milk, um, right? And so that's a huge problem. I think what we're seeing right now in California is the fact that we really suffer from a lack of water pretty much habitually right? That when you look at just animal proteins, it requires vastly more grain, water than producing plant-based proteins. Producing one kilogram of animal protein requires 100 times more water 
than producing one kilogram of grain protein. And that agriculture accounts for 70% of global water withdrawal. Think about that, 70%? FAO stands for Food and Agricultural uh, Organization. So you can get that information through the United Nations. Um, that's huge. And so again, what this tells us is there has to be a different way if people are going to have access to continue to eat meat, if you want to eat non-human animals, the way it's done has to be fundamentally different. If you talk about animal welfare, we can look at just aquatic animals. We see that we extract that much fish from the oceans per year and that it leads to overfishing and bycatch, right? Some target animals have bycatch up to 98%, meaning for every two target animals, 98 non-target species are thrown back into the ocean dead or dying. If you think of just about what happens in factory farms, you, you hear about ear notching and tattooing and branding, um, continuous impregnation, creating a high concentration of animal waste, thereby contributing to the rise of diseases in both farmed animals and laborers, increased use of antibiotics, and increased risk of antibiotic resistant pathogen. We're going to talk more about what happens in these places later on as well. Right? And so we see that the animals are suffering, the people who work in the places are suffering, the communities that are near them are suffering. And that one way in which they're suffering is as a consequence of climate change, right? Um, the FAO reports, uh, livestock report says that um, animal agriculture currently amounts to 18% of the global warming effect and even larger contribution in the transportation sector worldwide. So all the cars, all the planes, all the boats, everything. The way we grow, uh, the way we do animal agriculture takes up more uh, or, or produces more greenhouse gases. And we think about the fact that the uh, majority of the global poor rely on agriculture sector for food and economic security, climate change disproportionately affects black indigenous and other marginalized people, but in particularly women, because the majority of the farmers in the world, almost 60% are in fact women. As you see in this picture that's behind, most of these laborers are in fact women. And so that leads us to the human rights and, and welfare. So when respect to human impact, and again, industrial agriculture disproportionately harms BIPOC folks, right? Whether it is access to clean water in Flint, or whether it's land sovereignty and standing rock, or food injustice in black communities, it's clear that environmental practices are always racialized, and racializing practices are always environmental. There is no clean distinction between human beings and the environment. This is where I think Christianity has had some, um, where Christianity is complicit and perpetuating this myth of distinction between humans and nature, rather than recognizing we exist within nature, we are a part of nature, we're deeply interconnected. There is no um, bifurcation, right? There is no duality. Um, we can live only if nature continues to live because we are in fact a part of nature, right? We were the last animals to be created in those narratives, right? In the epic poem that talks about how we came to be. When we see ourselves like that, we see that there is no distinction that we are connected. And when we think about it with respect to structural racism, we see that these practices within the American context are deeply interlinked with racism, and as I will show later, sexism as well. When you talk about slaughterhouse workers, you hear and see about a lot of racial hierarchy. For those of you who paid attention to what's happened um, and as a con consequence of COVID-19, this probably isn't new news to you because you saw what was happening in these slaughterhouses when, when um, coronavirus started running through them, that there's a particular kind of racial hierarchy where depending on if you're indigenous or if you're black or if you're um, uh, Latinx, that is a kind of caste system in terms of what job you can have in these particular kind of slaughterhouses. Typically, they have about a 100% turnover rate in the low production jobs. And so some of the few plants that we've been able to get reliable data on, because there are laws that prevent people from actually researching what happens in these places, which tells us something about the way in which we think about the democratic process, that we can actually even audit places, right, to hold them accountable, um, is that, uh, you know, again, uh, basically people work there for less than a year, 100% turnover rate. There is a, these two articles on this slide, and again, I'm gonna share with you all the slide deck, I think are excellent. Um, both of them, at the slaughterhouse, I think maybe came out in 2010, and the ICE article um, came out in 2018. Um, and so, but basically, they talk about the structural 
racism and, a, and abuse that takes place in these slaughterhouses. And the, we cannot forget the exploitation of prison labor. Now this I think is what's deeply fascinating because while we understand that prisons are pred predominantly populated by black and indigenous other people of color, they also are populated by a whole lot of white folks, right? So this is just people who are just seen as less than human who we believe it's okay to exploit their labor. Right. And so that is a, a, a bit of a challenge. And I think for those of us who are people of faith, it should cause us some distress to see that we uh, can be complicit in a system that sanctions this kind of dehumanization. So when you think about um, food security and access, um, I tend to use the word food apartheid rather than food desert. Because as my uh, environmentalist friends reminds me, as my ecologist friends remind me, deserts are naturally occurring phenomenons. Um, they, you know, that's a part of how the planet has continued to evolve. Um, and when you look at the disproportionate harm that lack of access to food and certain kinds of other entities um, has had on these communities, this is not natural, right? It is something that has been inflicted upon them. So it is not a desert in this sense, it is very much apartheid, something that is being put upon them. Um, and we see this in black, rural, and poor communities. And I wanna be clear here too, it's this harms rural communities that are, that are not predominantly black, that are usually predominantly white or predominantly Latinx. And so this is what one of those um, issues I like to call a fusing issue where literally everybody is harmed by, by this, right? Like everybody has, should be deeply invested in working towards the elimination of how we do things, but we're not all in conversation with each other. A part of my research took me down to Louisiana, actually to the plantations that my ancestors worked in. And I was able to see um, and talk to, I should have already seen it because I go to Louisiana pretty much every year, talk to uh, poor people of all races in those communities and see how they struggle with food access and how their own particular um, political uh, persuasions has helped or harm uh, what they're actually suffering and going through. Um, again, like I said, rural communities are suffering. They make up 63% of the counties in the United States and 78% of the counties with the highest rate of overall food insecurity. And 84% of the counties with the highest rate of children at risk are rural. Um, as I mentioned earlier, farming and food security is a woman's issue. Because um, they are, women are the foundation of the third world agricultural economy, even if they only get a fraction of the training and support, right? They comprise a, a huge portion of the labor. Um, in Africa, women constitute 52% of the population, um, yet they make up 75% of the agricultural workforce, right? Um, as a whole, women produce more than half of the world's food and provide more than 80% of the needs in food insecure households and regions. And so we're talking about food sovereignty or food justice. You're talking about a woman's issue. And I think that cannot be uh, overstated. This is probably one of the saddest things um, that I have to talk about, but it's one of the things that, and I teach these, I teach a course, multiple courses uh, at USD, obviously, but my course on food and religion, this I would say is a topic that um, tends to make the deepest impact on my students. Um, and we don't have, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I have been read several articles um, that talk about the farmer suicide crisis. And this is a crisis that's happening both in the United States and globally, uh, where farmers are out of the stress of their inability to provide for their families, their inability to um, make sure that they can economically provide um, is causing them to kill themselves. And what they're finding is the very thing that motivates them to be farmers, this desire for provision, this desire to be connected to your, to care for others is the thing that drives them to depression, which leads to suicide because they struggle with their inability to do something they feel as though God has called them to do. It has literally now become one of the more dangerous professions in terms of suicide rates. And in fact, the num they, many speculated numbers are lower than they ought be because in some instances, it's hard to tell if someone committed suicide or if it was an accident, quote unquote, right? And so this is where we find ourselves. And this is a deep and profound challenge. This exists as in South Africa, I have it in India. Um, this article in The Guardian, I think it's a really good job. Um, there's another book called Stuffed and Starved by Raj Patel that talks about the global epidemic of farmer suicides. Um, but this is a profound deal.
often these farmers find themselves in places where they get bought up by uh, corporate conglomerates that limits their ability to actually do the work that they want to do and have the control they want to have on their land because the only way they can survive is to get caught up in the cycle of agribusiness rather than agriculture. So how does this impact public health? Well, I mentioned earlier COVID-19, right? Um, we know COVID-19 emerged from a wet market in China, um, but it is something, coronavirus has existed in non-human animals in different iterations. This is a new novel version of it. My wife is a veterinarian. When this happened, she was telling me, she's like, oh, this is you know, how it works in non-human animals. Um, and what we do know is that if we continue on the same path, we are more than likely going to have multiple cases of pathogen um, interspecies disease pathogen transmission, as my wife calls it, that will lead to more and more pandemics. Um, the challenge that we face right now is what are we going to do about it, right? Um, what are we, how are we going to begin to change it? Um, beyond COVID-19, what we see is um, an increase in respiratory, neurobehavior, mental illnesses amongst res communities who live next to factory farms, and um, we see other communities that suffer from the overuse of antibiotics in the industry, that it's giving cause to the rise of antibiotic resistance in the United States and across the world, right? That's a serious public health issue um, that is, they believe, could kill 10 million people per year worldwide by 2050 because of the antibiotic uh, resistant infections. So, so we have to use different kinds of antibiotics for different things. So these are the links to those articles that I mentioned um, that will kind of explain a little bit more about each of those uh, uh, points that I made. Uh, that way, you, again, you can continue to read those yourselves. So what can we do, right? What can we do? Um, I didn't want to end this on a kind of depressing note, but I did want to be clear about the challenge that we face. Um, and so there's some things that I want to point you to in places and resources I think you can go to to really wrestle with some of these questions and say, okay, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for my church and my community to take food justice and food sovereignty seriously? First thing I think we can do before we decide to just, one thing I like to say, <laughs> as, a, as you might be able to tell, I talk a lot about spirituality and contemplation and compassion, so it's deeply embedded in how I see myself and, and the kind of Christianity I practice. Um, a friend of mine likes to say, uh, don't just do something, sit there. Meaning, really kind of think about what it is you want to do before you run out and do it, because um, good intentions um, can get in the way of doing a lot of good, rather than saying, okay, let's be more thoughtful, let's make a plan, and let's say, okay, we plan to do this in six months, rather than saying, okay, let's do this tomorrow. But make a plan and actually recognize that you need to get to action. And the challenge I think many places get is they get stuck into just a planning phase. So learning more about the issues can include reading. One book I would highly recommend is Good Food by my friend Jennifer Ayers, who's at Emory University. Um, it's, it's a practical theological book, so it's not, um, it's, no, <laughs> it's written like a normal book. It's not like written uh, like many other uh, texts uh, that I've encountered that deal with this issue from a Christian perspective. Um, organiz or schools like uh, Wake Forest Divinity School, Methodist Theological School of Ohio, and uh, Duke University all have food-centered uh, structures that deal with food and religion. Uh, Wake Forest, I think they call it Ecological Well-Being. The Methodist Theological School has um, Seminary Hill Farm. And Duke University has the World Food Policy Institute, which I've, I've worked with all three of these institutions and feel confident in that they're trying to wrestle with these things um, in ways that are consistent with um, how people of faith should be thinking about it. And to be clear, while I am talking about this from a particular perspective of, of um, farmed animals, um, non-human animals, and how it impacts BIPOC folks, um, that's not the limit of their work. They, they talk about things broadly understood and I talk about things broadly understood but I want to share with you all some things that I think you probably had not encountered before. Um, other organizations that you should consider learning about is the Black Church, Black Church Food Security Network by my friend Heber Brown. Um, they are doing some great work with uh, farming, gardening, connecting farmers and, and actually trying to create food sovereign communities um, along the Maryland, Virginia kind of area. And the Food Empowerment Project, which is based in um, California, Northern California, or I should say just North Central California. Um, and they do a lot of work with uh, farm workers, particularly Latinx communities. And the second thing that you can begin to do is begin to think theologically about food systems, right? To really think about these kinds of questions I have posed for you right here. How might your diet better reflect your faith? 
right? What is it that you believe to be true about who you are, who God has called you to be, about the kind of sacred interconnectedness that we say we believe in? And how might that actually influence what it is you consume and how you go about procuring what it is you consume? How might your advocacy for food policy for farmers and farm workers better reflect your faith? How might it better reflect the commitment that we are called to have to love God, to love our neighbors, and to love ourselves? How might we, the church, care for creation in ways that promote equity and food sovereignty? How might we empower communities to be able to provide for themselves something that, some, that they generally want to do, right? How might we create spaces where we can actually employ people or give people the opportunity to actually have jobs, to grow food, to sell within the community, right? How, what role can churches play? There's an article I should have pasted out here that just came to my mind right now on, I might just include in the email sent to your pastors, but the title of the article is How Church Land Can Become Farmland. And it's an article that, that um, uh, interviews these clergy in Michigan and California and Michigan, California, North Carolina, and Maryland who are taking land that they have in the church and they're actually farming. Like they are actually in Florida, actually I should say Florida too, where they're turning parts of it into, in, into farmland and they are providing food for their community. They are doing ministry for their community right? Employing people, feeding people, not worried about making enough money, but making enough money to continue to do it and to give people a just wage in the process. It's a beautiful thing. It is indeed to me like the Eucharist brought fully alive. So um, again, that article is turning church, how to turn church land into farmland. I'll include it in the email. I'll, I'll send to you, um, uh, your pastor, so you guys will have that. Um, so these are the questions I like to end with, uh, and I will stop sharing my screen now and just kind of take any questions you guys might have. I look at the chat because I saw some chat questions popped up as well. Um, so yeah, uh, let me see. Yeah. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Incredible. So I, I'm good. sure we have a lot of questions to, to cover on that presentation. Donna, you have your hands up, hand up, and then feel free to unmute if you want to jump in and ask something after. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Just really wonderfully done. I'm very familiar in the middle of the country. I have many connections in, in the throes of hog farming. They turn 4,600 hogs every six months in this hugely evangelical Christian hub. Can you, con I mean, to me, it's beyond um, anything I would prefer to do, but I also recognize I have this white privilege of highly organic vegetarian life and they're supporting their families and it's a huge evangelical hub and yet it's this hog farming thing can you help re help reconcile that yes i can actually because <laughs> it is difficult right it is difficult because in their mind they believe um that they are doing something that's in line in alignment with their own christian beliefs and principles what i believe is that it they haven't sufficiently taken seriously what it, our, our, our call, uh, I guess I should say, broadly speaking, they have a, a theology of dominion rather than a theology of what we might call stewardship, broadly understood. And so they understand that their role is to, I won't say exploit, but that they can use these resources for their own personal benefit rather than actually recognizing the kind of interconnected nature of ecology. Um, it is a deep, misreading, I believe, not only of the Hebrew Bible, but also of, of the Gospels. Um, and, and where I think uh, there, the room for them to grow is, or how I talk to people like that, right? As, as, that's what I should say. How do I talk to them? So the first thing I do is I, I recognize their common humanity. And I say, I know you're, I, I, you know, you're doing this because you're trying to provide for your family, you're trying to provide for a job, and you have these particular ways of thinking. And that's, so I totally want you them to feel seen and feel heard. But then I bring up the, the harms that it caused, right? Because many of them know that it causes harms. Many of them know that it's not new, right? And then I invite them to imagine. And I think it, it is indeed a failure of imagination that causes a lot of this. Because there are other ways to do it. There are other ways I think we can actually um, grow food and do it in a way that's sustainable, that, does it, that actually can employ people. But it's gonna require us to um, 
to break free from this kind of, and this is really, I think, where you get into a lot of it, this kind of capitalistic framework that's built on exploitation. Because many of those same communities that I've had conversations with, both in, in Michigan, in Indiana, and in Illinois, are often also wrapped up in a theology of, of um, kind of prosperity, right? This kind of prosperity gospel thing. And so they think that, that God has blessed them and, and it's harming others. And it's this lack of care for others. So some of this is wrapped up in how you see, do you see these other people who are working, you know, in your field as full, as full human beings, right? Do you believe that you, would you want your children to work on those lines, right? Um, it's those kinds of questions that they haven't wrestled with. But my experience has been, you have to approach them um, and all people recognizing, um, you know, like their, their common humanity and recognizing what it is they are trying to do so they feel heard and valued. But, but I, I agree, it's a flawed theological construct right that that that's allowing them to um to think that that's normal thank you for that question donna that's great thanks thanks, thanks. um let me see if there's some questions in here that uh so one question that i want to say really quick uh that i think i can get to um oh and you kind of answered it actually in terms of how to do this for people that live below the poverty line so this is an interesting story now this is maybe more, it will be slightly more challenging in the pandemic because resources are scarce and depend in, in stores. And I think prices are fluctuating. But when I talked to my grandpa about how he ate when he was growing up, he basically ate a vegetarian diet because that was a poor people's diet. And for some reason we have this ideology or this thinking that eating vegetarian or even vegan is associated with wealth. When in the rest of the world, it's actually associated with poverty, right? So some of this is the way in which we conceive of it, but often it's related to our time and ability to cook. That is a huge part of it, right? Because if you are if you eat plant-based or if you don't eat a lot of meat, if you eat vegetarian, you have to really cook your food, right? And so I think that is something we have to really also talk about in terms of work and how do we empower people? How do we create um, spaces and, and, and organizations and programs or meals or whatever that a lot of people actually have sufficient time to prep? Some of this is maybe cooking classes but also it may just be asking people what they need like for my mother my mother when i grew up she knew how to cook she needed somebody to watch us for an hour right like that's all she needed so she had time to do something so if they need cooking classes they need a they need a you know a after school program in the community that all that in this in turn would help address the food insecurity right and so we have to recognize these things are are interconnected and often e the, the economic struggles that many people have that, that are tied to this often may not be as limiting with regards to uh, food access as we might uh, assume. But I also think this is a call for the church to step in, right? So the churches I talked about, the Black Church Food Security Network, that, that have these farms, that connect with farmers, but the churches that grow food, they sell the food at cost. Like, and by the cost, they mean they, they sell food at cost that, that is allowed them to employ the people that they continue to employ, to give them a living wage and the benefits that they said they would give them. And that's it, right? And the whole point is to serve the community, not to make money. We can do that as churches. I mean, like, you know, we can, we can actually say, well, how might we best use this land that we already have, this resource that we already have? And so I think we can begin to, be, to answer some of our own challenges that we, that we are posing. Um, let me see. The last thing I'll say briefly for other questions is yes. Somebody has a question out here. Large farms are driving small farms out of business. That, that is, that's a huge problem. And unfortunately, this follows particular political trajectories. And we have to, and, but neither, I should say this, neither party does right by farmers. In my, I would argue, neither party. Um, we have to find ways to subvert this kind of, of structural system that we, that, that we have, because it is causing indeed um, to, to privilege people who are more exploitive than others. Oh, I see Guy has a question. Hi, great speech, great presentation. Um, there's a show I watch, it's called Trails to Oishi Tokyo. And it's really kind of interesting to watch because they take a certain food group from Japan and follow it where it's made and stuff like this. And the thing I've noticed is, it's the, the pride which, which, which would they take to make the food whether it be plant-based or if it's whatever, but mostly it's plant-based. And I don't think we're gonna see that kind of mentality in this country because 
it's like you said, big businesses taking over small farms and the farmers who farmed the land for years and took pride in their work are now being driven out and it's just big business and it's chemical driven and everything like that. In Japan, the mentality is completely different. They, they look at food differently than we do. For them, it's a religion. It's a experience that transcends um, just eating it. It's, you know, and the way they produce it is it, they take pride in it because they respect it. And I think that's what's missing in, in our food chain. And we're not, I don't think we're ever going to see that. I mean, it's going to be hard because like you said, it's, it's profit driven, it's capitalistic. It's, you know, it's lack of taking care of everybody. It's more, how much can I sell this for at the market? And that's what's the problem with organic. It's like you said, it's, if, if everything was vegan, it'd be, you know, it'd be a lot better, but nobody could afford it because it's always organic and it's always a dollar more than the celery right next to it. So anyways, thank you well, very much. No, you're, you're very welcome. And I know we have to wrap up because it's almost over, but I'll say quickly two things. One problem with organic is that it shouldn't even be labeled. It should be normal. Like that's like labeling things organic is like, like, you know, I don't know, like, to me, it's an oxymoron because it's, it's a normal celery. You should label the stuff that's not normal, right? So that's the fundamental first problem. Like, it doesn't make, literally, it makes absolutely no sense to, to label the, the normal stuff or, you know, I'm like, mm, that's part. So it's, 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 some of this is ideology wrapped up in food. But the, another, to your point, um, the way we think about food in America is much more about inputs, calorie inputs. And, it, and, it, and it's not like that. In, it's not like that in Japan, as you mentioned. It's not like that. I've, I've been, I taught English in Korea for two summers. It's not like that in Korea. It's not like that in, in Italy, France, like all these other kinds of countries, right? And so what I think we can do as people of faith is, is to try to recreate that kind of mentality in our own communities and, and, change, and start where we are with our own particular communities, with our own children and the communities that we're in and say, how can we begin to really kind of evangelize and proselytize this way of thinking about food. And, and fortunately for us, we have this thing called the Eucharist. We have this thing that we do every, at least every month, if you're a Protestant and every week, if you're, if you're a Catholic, to talk, and it's about food. This whole story is about an open table. So we have the opportunity to really think critically, but what do we mean when we're talking about food? And how might we begin to re-educate ourselves um, in the ways we think about this? And, and so I guess for me, I take your point, Guy, it is, it's a long road ahead, but I think that we can be leaders in this run. And by we, I mean the church broadly understood. We can be leaders in this particular kind of path. Um, yeah, I'll wrap us up here. Um, Dr. Carter, that was such an amazing presentation. Um, food justice is something that Jacob and I are personally really passionate about, but we have never been able to speak as eloquently about it as you. So I'm like taking talking points from this. Um, but yeah, I think this is a great... Um, next step for our church, we are people who love to put our faith into action at Claremont UCC, and I think this is something that we just um, are primed and ready to go, it's something to think about theologically about, you know, we're not gathering right now, but when we do again eventually and we are enjoying food together, how can we think through what we're serving as a church and what we're, who we're supporting with our dollars when we buy for each other for large crowds and we're serving hundreds of people? Um, that's an opportunity to put our faith into action and, and make a statement about our social justice values. So I think this is really exciting. I think this is a next step for Claremont UCC. And um, if anybody wants uh, tips on plant-based diets, you know that Jacob and I are, are all about it and we would love to share recipes. We will drop off plant-based food to your doorstep and um, we have lots of resources that we love as well. So um, thank you again, Dr. Carter, if we could give uh, another digital applause. Um, that was so great. And um, I believe he is willing to share his contact information for any follow-up questions that people might have. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. We'll see you in worship. And uh, let's go eat something great today. Eat something healthy and sustainable today in honor of this presentation. Oh yeah, you have one more thing? One more, well, I wanna, Stephen has something he said about a course teaching at Cal Poly Pomona. Steve, Steve, I wanna ask you to please email me because I'm interested in the syllabus for that, for that class. Because that class sounds something like, something I would actually be like to kind of incorporate in what we're doing at USD. So please send me an email, yeah. Google me. I have a website, you can totally do that. And I would love to connect. I already found your email address. I'll do All that right. here Sweet. shortly. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much. This was great. Thank this you is so great. Much. All right. Bye.